Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamblett, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, May 21st. It's just a couple days till Naval Academy graduation. Blue Angels practice show this afternoon and Blue Angels uh, main show tomorrow afternoon. So we're looking forward to that. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Chinese People's Liberation Army Navy. First, uh, this episode is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, the members of the Institute have been the foundation for the open forum and the keel upon which everything we do is built. From proceedings in Naval History magazines to USNI News, our conferences and events, and Naval Institute press books, the Naval Institute is a private, independent, nonprofit, 503C nonprofit. If you're, a mem- if you're not a member, become one today. If you are a member, thank you. Please introduce a shipmate or fellow Marine to the Institute. Go to usni.org forward slash join. Before I introduce my guests, a couple of uh, public service announcements. On June 12th, my guest will be retired Marine Corps General Frank McKenzie. McKenzie is the author of a new Naval Institute press book titled The Melting Point, and he was the commander U.S. Central Command from 2019 to 2023 a pivotal time that included the drone strike on Iranian General Qasem Soleimani and the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. His book is terrific. I look forward to talking to him in person on the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center on our episode on June 12th. All right, now for my guest today. Joining me from his home in Switzerland is retired Navy Captain Jim Fennell, an expert on the Chinese PLA Navy former chief of intelligence for the U.S. Pacific Fleet, and he's been on the show before. And as I mentioned to him in an email yesterday, um, the most viewed episodes of this show have been episodes with Jim Fennell. So, Jim, great to have you back on the show. Well, Bill, it's really great to be back, and uh, I'm really uh, humbled by uh, the the report that you just made. Uh, I don't know why, but very humbling. Well, I think one is uh, you're a compelling guest, uh, and two, there's a lot of interest in the PLA Navy in our uh, in our audience. So I think the combination of uh, of you and the subject matter is uh, is a winning one. Uh, before we get to some Q and A, I want to just say congrats on your book, uh, new out, just published by War Room Books. Uh, Jim is the co-author of a book titled "Embracing Communist China: America's Greatest Strategic Failure." And we have a review of the book by uh, Admiral Paul Becker coming in the June issue of the magazine. So uh, if you like our book reviews, which I do, we, I think we do a fantastic job with book, re- book reviews. And it is uh, one of the reviews that's coming in the June issue. So um, just, Jim, you want to give our, our uh, listeners a brief overview of the book? Yeah, uh, Bill, uh, it was written with my co-author, Dr. Brad Thayer, and it basically addresses the, the, the issue of How did we get to this position where China is in such a position of strength and capability in terms of not just military power, but, you know, total comprehensive national power? How did they get there? And what was our role as United States uh, government in uh, watching this essentially happen for 35 years and we didn't do anything? And so it's the book is uh, probably not going to be well received in some circles because it really holds the U.S., uh, leaderships uh, from the president on down uh, through our, you know, in our service, the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, for why why did we allow this to happen? So it, it's kind of a academic examination of what the history was of engagement and how engagement came along, uh, threat deflation, and how even you know in our community, the intelligence community, we may have downplayed the threat, and then uh, we come up with some recommendations on how we have to turn this around and and get back to a great power competition, if you will. Uh, and so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book, I think, that uh, tells, a, tells a story. Uh, and I think it, the purpose of telling the story is to get people's attention to say, hey, we can't continue doing what we've been doing uh, with this uh, you know, kind of nonstop engagement without really holding the Chinese Communist Party to account and really to defend ourselves. Uh, for instance, the folks in Wall Street and Silicon Valley have spent a lot of time providing a lot of money uh, to the Chinese Communist Party that allowed them to build this navy that we're going to talk about in the in the rest of this interview. Yeah, and and it's also I, I think it's really important that this is it can be a uh, a nonpartisan argument because as you said, this goes back really uh, you know Nixon and Kissinger 
opened the door to China. And that was a smart geostrategic move in the at the height of the Cold War. Because, uh, you know, being able to sort of divide Russia and China and, and drive a wedge there made a lot of sense geostrategically. Uh, but then over time, through Republican and Democratic administrations, we've had this, um, you, you know, a, almost a race to engage with China and to enter, you know, get them into the WTO and to lower trade barriers. Uh, many things which, as you point out, uh, in your articles that you've written for us, but also in the book, um, have led to uh, huge advantages for China, which is which it has then turned into uh, a massive military buildup and a uh, a very different perspective on where the world should be going than the one that the United States and our allies uh, and partners share. So. Uh, congrats on the book. Let, let's get into the article that you've, that you've written now for the, I think, third or fourth year in a row in our May issue, which is always dedicated to the uh, international navies. Uh, and so this year, your article is titled Another Historic Year for the PLA Navy. Uh, for our listeners, if you've got the print magazine at home, you can find it on pages 67, 66 and 67. Uh, and so, Jim, let's start by talking about Admiral Dong Jun the former chief of the PLA Navy. What happened to him at the end of 2023? So in December, uh, as they start making the announcements for the uh, the two uh, sessions that the, the National People's Congress has in, in March of uh, each year, uh, they announce new party uh, or, or new members of the committees. And part of that is you start looking at uh, who's in the military and military appointments. And so Admiral Dong Jun, who is the commander, as you said, of the PLA Navy, uh, was appointed and announced to be the 14th Minister of Defense for the, the People's Republic of China. And what's important about that is that he's the first admiral in the history of the People's Republic of China to be the head of the PLA. And this is quite a, a statement, quite an achievement. It got a lot of attention, obviously, because there had been a gap for about four months as the previous Minister of Defense, uh, PLA General Li Shangfu had gone missing, and there was a big uh, controversy regarding whether or not he had been taken out by Xi for corruption or some kind of pushback that there was a, a con you know uh, some kind of mini revolt in the PLA and the senior leaders because they didn't like the, the, the where Xi was going in terms of his policies towards uh, Taiwan and what he wanted to have the PLA do, and then there was some firings and whatnot in the in the PLA rocket force. And so it, it's fueled a lot of, uh, I, I would call it conspiracy theories and rumors about the stability of Xi and the stability of the PRC and the PLA. And I didn't really buy into much of that. But what I do know is that Admiral D uh, Dong Zhong is a really, uh, you know, seminal historical figure in the PRC. And it demonstrates that the PRC is I, in my opinion, moving towards its strategic agenda, which is at least in the region in the Western Pacific, to be able to take Taiwan. They prefer not to use military force, but they now have a man in place that's running the entire entirety of the PLA who's a, a, a naval officer. And he's not just any naval officer. He's a surface warfare officer. Uh, he's got a lot of experience in the PLA headquarters. He had a lot of experience in the Eastern and Southern uh, theater commands before they were designated theater commands in 2016. But it's probably the most important aspect of what he does or, or what he's done in his career is that in 2013, 2014, he was basically the first commander of the East China Sea or the EC Fleet Joint Operations Center, the JOC, right across from Taiwan. And so, as, as you know, from our days uh, in uniform, we know that the Chinese military had been trying to move into joint operations, joint uh, op exercises, joint training, things of this nature. And it was back in this time frame in 2013, 2014, right as Xi is coming to power, uh, that we see this jock stood up in the East China Sea. And Admiral Dong was that first commander. So, uh, you know, some of us, uh, you know, like yourself, when we were out in the Pacific, we know what joint task forces can do. We were involved with some joint task forces. We know the power uh, of joint operations in terms of uh, the, the collaboration and the coordination and getting everybody on the, the same sheet of music. Uh, 
on the same plan. And uh, this is, I think, what's happened is that you've got a guy that's been basically for the last decade devoted to and thinking about and planning, how would I take Taiwan? And so now he's in charge of the PLA, uh, not just the Navy, but the PLA. And this is an historic event. And it really uh, is historic in the sense that because the PRC has been and China has been perceived as a land power for the last 700 years since they had their fleets with under uh, Admiral Zhang Ha. Essentially, they've been, you know, dominated by land thinking, land warfare, land power. And the PLA, certainly when they established the PRC under Mao, they were, uh, you know, the people's war. They were army and everybody and everything in the PRC or in the PLA had been dominated by the army until Xi came to power and reorganized the PLA in 2015. And he basically brought the army down as equal with the Navy and the Air Force. And he created the then Strategic Support Force and Joint Logistic Forces. But he, in a sense, he elevated the Navy and the Air Forces to be equals with the army. And now we're seeing kind of the culmination of that with a, a, a naval admiral being put in charge of the, of the PLA. And I think we're going to not just see uh, business as usual. We're going to see probably more uh, significant changes out of the way the PLA operates uh, as a force. And I think it's, uh, you know, should, should be a very important uh, data point for people to understand where the PLA is heading in this process. Jim, let me ask you a question about, uh, that, that, you know, either elevating the Navy or, or relegating the army to a, to a slightly lower position than it has had. I'm curious about, um, the, the ongoing, you know, uh, changing relationship between China and Russia, if if that also, in terms of their strategic objectives and goals, they don't have to worry about their Western uh, flank, right? They don't, they're not worried about Russia. Russia is a strategic cooperative partnership uh, of the highest order in China's thinking now. So perhaps the army is less important, but their desire to push out around the world, you know, raises that naturally elevates the position of the Navy uh, and their desire to, to uh, resolve the blue territorial problems that they've got. You know, they've got the Taiwan problem and they've got the South China Sea and the Nine Dash Line and all of that. Um, I'm wondering if, if you think that that also is part of the thinking here of why the PLA is a little bit, the Army itself is a little uh, less, uh, um, in, in the limelight and the, and the Navy's role has, has been elevated by Xi. I think, I think you're basically right, Bill. Uh, but just today in the, Ch in the Chinese press, they talked about the first ever completion of a joint uh, uh, army military exercise with Mongolia along their Northern border. So in oh. a way, in a weird way, it frees up the army to do army things instead of trying to be this total control of everything, which is what the PLA was 10 years ago, where, PLA army generals, you know, they were kind of mini mafia bosses with, you know, their fiefdoms and they were controlling, you know, musical troops and army brigades and, and doing army things, trying to spread it everywhere. And yep. now where everybody's kind of equal and now you have a Navy guy in charge, the army guys are like, well, I only got army stuff to do. And where do I do army stuff along the Indian border, or along the, my Western border, along my Northern border. So yeah. in a way, I think it's going to actually focus the PLA on on ground warfare more than they've ever been focused on it and also as you rightly mentioned the naval portions and the expeditionary and power projection aspects of this reorganization are really obvious are becoming more and more obvious each day as we see the development of their their naval capabilities and forces and you know uh, refuelers and things of that nature and we're watching them exercise around the world with the russians uh, you know they did another circumnavigation of Honshu again, uh, you know, for a second time in a row where there are large numbers of Chinese and, and Russian ships transiting around uh, Japan and putting the, the, you know, the threat on, on the Japanese. So I think what we see is we're seeing a professionalization of the PLA. It becomes more and more like they want to become like the, the United States in terms of joint operations, joint training. Uh, they reorganize their, their military regions into these joint theater commands that really resemble our geographic combatant commanders and they have the functional commanders as well. So, it, it, you know, we always always want to be on guard against mirror imaging, but it seems like 
that China is going out of their way to mirror a lot of what, what the U.S. has done and, and get the best of breed. And we know that they studied the Kosovo War. They know we studied uh, Desert Storm and Desert Shield. We, we know that they studied OIF and these other things. And, they, and, and so they go to school on us and they'll put their own adaptations on it. But clearly, uh, this, this kind of reorganization is, is, is making them more combat uh, focused and, and joint and, and t working together. And we see that implemented in, in the operations like we saw uh, with the uh, Joint Sword, for instance, last year, where you had the Rocket Force, the Air Force, the Naval Forces all cooperating together to, you know, train and exercise around Taiwan and to scare Taiwan into, you know, capitulation. Yeah, yeah, great points. Uh, let's turn to shipbuilding now. Uh, how many ships and what kinds of ships did the PLA Navy commission last year? Yeah, so I, w I did some, I, I mean, I got some stuff in the article, but I did some, some more research just for this. Uh, last year in 2023, the Chinese commissioned 10 uh, combatants and we commissioned nine, um, and I could go down through the years, but basically since 2015 through today, uh, China commissioned 161 warships and submarines, and we've only we commissioned 53. So about a three to one advantage. Wow. Before COVID, that number was higher. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, China was commissioning 23, 21 warships. Since uh, the last two years, it's been 10 and 10. So they went down a little bit after COVID. So uh, they, they backed off that uh, a little bit, but they're still, if, if you look at the strategic trend line, it's like this, they're going like this, they're just going up. Yeah. So we see a continuation of uh, advancement in weapon system designs like the type 075 and this new type 076, it's supposed to be coming along. And then obviously the carriers we will talk about. So there's, there's a, and there's also a new type 054B, uh, 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 an advanced uh, Zhang Kai-2 class frigate uh, that, that the Chinese were pretty happy about and talked about in public. Uh, and then there was just in the last week or two, something about a new mysterious, uh, there's like only one image of it, of a new, looks like a, some kind of uh, uh, Zhang Diao class Corvette uh, size vessel, but it's a new, uh, new hull frame. And so there's a new mystery ship, they're calling it, uh, but we'll find out about what it is. But it, it just seems like China just continues to pump out not just more of the ones that they've built, the ones that they like, like the Luyang 3s and the Zhang Kai 2s and the Renhais, but they're, they're, they're continuing to advance and say, well, let's practice or, or not practice, but let's experiment with other things. So they're, in a way, they're doing what we say we do, which is we experiment with hull designs and then kind of put it out in the fleet and let them perfect it, and then we'll go into mass production. We don't ever seem to get to that last stage like they do, where they actually actually perfect it. They like what they get after a couple of years, and then they go into, you know, the dumplings production of, uh, you know, dozens of warships in, in a class. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have a sense, Jim, that, uh, you know, as you said, going from 20-something ships per year to now the last couple of years, 10, largely because of COVID slowdowns, do you have a sense that they're going to come out of that and ramp production back up? Or is there a sense that, you know, 10 or so ships per year is kind of their new target? I, I, I think that they're going to ramp it up again. I think they're going to, it, it, they may not go up to the high twenties, uh, but I think they'll ramp it. They'll continue to ramp it back up to recover some of that. Cause there's other classes of ships that I think that they still want to, to develop and, and field. Uh, because they still have, well, they still have the large, they have the largest Navy in the world. They still have Navy that's not capable yet of sustained carrier strike group operations globally. And I think so they're going to need dozens more of the type 091 and 9, uh, 903 uh, comprehensive refueling ships and resupply ships. They're going to need a lot more of that. And they're going to need some more, uh, you know, they've got one type, uh, they've got, right now they got four care. well, they got three carriers, we expect the fourth to be announced, they announced in March, one of the commissars, political commissars, a vice admiral in the PLA Navy said, hey, we're going to have six by 2035, so we know they want to have a large number of carrier strike groups, they don't want to have a large number of expeditionary strike groups, so if they have eight 
type 055 run high class cruisers, their their shotguns, they're going to want to have one for each one of those uh, carrier strike groups and expeditionary strike groups. So if they have say six and six, that's all, that means they need 12. And if you want to have, you know, spares and things of that nature, they're going to need another, you know, six probably. So they're going to need like 18 of those. So they're going to need another 10. So producing 10 more type 055 seems to be a reasonable assessment that they, that they would uh, put in for over the next 10 years. Got it. So Jim, when you and I were out in the Pacific, so uh, you were spent more time in the Pacific than I did, but um, let's go back to, you know, 15, 18 years ago, uh, some of the ships that the Chinese Navy, as they were ramping up production then, you know, the Luyang one was uh, relatively new at that time. Uh, the Zhang Kais were, were new at the time. Um, and so now we're into sort of mid-life uh, cycle period, right? So a lot of those ships are now 15, 18 years old. Um, what, what do you see in terms or hear about in terms of, um, you know, mid-life uh, maintenance and, and those kinds of things? Are the Chinese now realizing, that, oh, okay, now we've got these ships it's time to you know bring them back in for the the mid mid cycle mid life cycle um, you know major overhaul major updates or are they husbanding their their sort of readiness with those ships because they don't deploy them as much as our ships the U.S. Navy ships are you know where are they in terms of you know their older ships now in having to maintain them? I don't think we've seen a lot of evidence that shows that they're into some major. Uh, mid-life cycle program. At least I haven't seen it. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean that they haven't done it. And as you said, I mean, they've been sending these uh, counter piracy or naval task forces out to the Gulf of Aden now since two, late 2008. So they're on the 45th, uh, 46th uh, expeditionary task force that, that's operating out there. And they, they kind of use, I'd say, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I put it in a ballpark around 60% of those vessels are the same. They're, they're, they're constantly using those. So in a way, they are husbanding some. They do spend a lot of time at sea, I think, in some sense, more than when we were watching them 15 years ago. I think they're a lot more at sea than they used to be. Uh, and my guess is, is that they're not, they're not stupid. So, I, you know, I always, when I get asked these kind of questions, and I don't know the answers, my my initial reaction is they're not stupid. And so they know, and they've studied us, they know that these ships aren't going to run forever. They know that the sea is a, you know, harsh on metal. So they're going to have some program uh, to keep these going. And they're not going to rebuild their fleet. They're just not going to flush them. Yeah. So that's not cost effective. And we don't see that. So I think what we see is, um, and I may have missed it, but I think that they're going to be more, we're going to see more ships going in. We just saw it, for instance, on one particular it's in the in the aircraft carriers, the Liaoning. Now she's a much older ship. She's a you know we got they got her from the Ukraine and you know she's so designed and and all of that. But they she spent most of this year or a large part of it getting worked on uh, up in the Bohai. So uh, in that sense, there's some areas where we already see it. I just don't think we have a lot of writing and talk about it from the Chinese. And I will just point out, you know, I. Like you said, I've been three or four years writing these articles each year about their year in review. Three or four years ago, when the press was still on the Chinese side a little bit more open, it was much easier to find out how many numbers of ships that they had commissioned or launched in a year. It gets harder and harder each year because they're they're starting to get tighter on what they talk about in, in the public domain. Uh, and so it makes it much harder. Now, folks at O&I and the people that are working like we did, they, they know. Uh, but yep. for us out and outside of the, in, in looking at this from uh, in the kind of the international marketplace of ideas, we, we need to understand that it's sometimes it's hard to get that information. But I think what I think the reasonable answer is, is that they're going to uh, they've invested so much for a decade and a half, two decades into this, that they're just not going to let it go. And I can tell you, I was on a Chinese frigate uh, in uh, in uh, Kiel, Germany in 2019. Now, that was five years ago. But that ship was well maintained. It wasn't like uh, you know in your time in, in in Russia. You know how the the Russians and the Soviets treated their warships. The Chinese yeah. are not like that. The, it, I thought I was on an American warship in terms of the material readiness and the way that the crew uh, treated and respected their their ship. 
Yeah. How old was that ship at the time? Uh, it was a John Kai two. Uh, I couldn't have been more than Bin Zhao. I think it was maybe not more than five years old. Got it. Got it. All right. So let's talk about aircraft carriers now. Bring us up to speed on the kinds of operations that the Chinese aircraft carriers uh, did last year. Where are they and how many? As you, you mentioned, they've got three with a fourth on the way, a goal to maybe get to six aircraft carriers by 2035. Uh, what were some of the operational highlights in, in 2023? Well, the workhorse, as we say in the article, was uh, was the Shandong, which is their first indigenous produced carrier, the, the second ski jump that resembles the first one, the Liaoning. Uh, and she was out basically in January, in April, in September, October, uh, and I think even in November. So she was out a lot last year, uh, operating in the South China Sea, then operating east of uh, Taiwan several times. Uh, going as far as within 350 miles of, of Guam, uh, operating, and at each phase of their operations, she she, she was doing something different, or, or or expanding and building upon previous at sea experiences. For instance, or in her first at sea periods in April, she was running about 30 sorties uh, a, a day on average. 30 aircraft sorry, Sorry about the bell. Um, Okay. Oh, it's supposed to be four o'clock. Um, <laughs> my wife in Switzerland. Got it. Yeah. Um, it, she she did about thirty sorties a day. Uh, when she went back out later in September, she was up to like over 63, 65 sorties a day. Um, now again, it's a it's a ski jump uh, aircraft carrier. It doesn't have any catapults. Uh, they only run in the J-15s. It's got limited range, limited uh, ordnance capacity based upon the, the launching, the weight that they can get off the deck. Um, and they have helicopters, Z-9. So it's not a, it's not a robust uh, air wing like you and I are, know and, and, and lived in. Uh, but it, it is showing a progression at a rapid pace. And so I just like to frame it in the terms of 10 years ago, 12 years, it's about 12 years ago, when Liao Ning first went to sea and, and started launching and recovering aircraft. So in the yeah. space of 12 years, they got three in the water uh, and they're flying hundreds of sorties. The, uh, the Shandong was out for nine days, one period, 15 days, another period, several hundred sorties over a couple of week period in blue water operations. What, you know, what we would call a blue water cert. They were away from any divert airfield. And so yeah. pretty impressive uh, that they're out there operating and it's not, you know, and they're operating in the strike group formation. There was one episode where they were out with 20 other uh, Chinese Navy combatants, largest PLA naval force, I think to date out in the East or in the, in the outside of the first Island chain. So they really uh, are demonstrating the, again, this trajectory line keeps going up in terms of their learning curve, uh, and we don't read, you know, if there's collisions or there's crashes or there's uh, 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 mishaps, we're not hearing about it. And we got the Japanese that are hawking these pretty closely and reporting them. So thankfully to the Japanese uh, Maritime Self-Defense Force, uh, they're watching on it, you know, every day that those carriers are outside the first island chain. Or if they're in and around Taiwan's waters, the Taiwan's uh, is watching them as well. And so we're not... We don't hear any big reports about major catastrophic failures. In fact, I have not read any. I've just yeah, read that they're more of our, yeah. They're just they're they're doing really well. Now, they're not doing again, they're not off of uh, SoCal and in a Com 2X where they're trying to surge to 200 plus sorties in a day and do that for four days in a row, you know, or something like that. Uh, but with what they have and the fact that they've got now Liao Ning, uh, Shandong, and now this Fujian. Uh, you know, they're going to have three aircraft carriers at an operational readiness, or it, I would say operationally ready within, by the end of 2025. And we'll still, if we haven't changed our policy, we'll still have just our one four deployed carrier. So even if they're not as capable, they have three times the capacity to show the flag and influence operations, whether it's, you know, uh, threatening the, the Philippines or Vietnam or, you know, circling around Taiwan or influencing Japan, they're going to have the capacity, uh, an increased capacity, even with the sub 
uh, sub subpar in comparison to U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, uh, that gives them something that we that we can't just blow off and disregard. Yeah. And it also changes the dynamic because we have to now take into consideration where are those carriers? Where are they if they were to decide to do an invasion? And we can't just ignore them and let them sit off the east coast of Taiwan and run strikes into Walian and Suau. You know, we got to We got to We would have to take it out. We'd have to respect that threat. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as you pointed out, so the, the Liaoning, uh, hull number 16, uh, was the carrier that was originally built, Soviet Navy, ended up in Ukraine, uh, was a, was an unfinished hull, sold to the Chinese. The story that, you know, back in the mid to late 2000s was that the Chinese were going to build it or, or uh, turn it into a floating casino, maybe in Shanghai. That didn't happen. The Navy actually turned it into an aircraft carrier. It's an operational carrier. Um, it was their first foray into you know carrier operations. Now they got the Shandong, uh, which is similar to the Liaoning, but entirely indigenously built uh, with some improvements right over the Liaoning. Ski jump ramp again. Uh, Fujian hull number three is not a ski jump ramp. It's electromagnetic uh, catapults. Um, where is, so she's afloat and roughly finished out, but has not started testing or, or operations at all, correct? We started her sea trials on 1 May. So they waited till May Day, an auspicious day for Chinese communists, uh, to have her come out. And we had been waiting. Uh, we thought maybe it was going to be on the anniversary of the PLA Navy in, in April, uh, earlier in April. And they didn't, they waited until 1 May. And that's when uh, they started their, uh, their sea trials. So we had seen the uh, uh, mooring trials. Uh, we had seen uh, the shot test uh, while they were in port uh, in Jiangnan, Dao, and, and off of Shanghai. So we, there was expectation that it would be out doing sea trials, I think maybe a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, but I, for whatever reason, they waited until 1 May, and, and she did about, I think, uh, eight, eight or nine days. I think it was eight days out for her first uh, sea trials. So Okay. She'll spend the rest of the year, you know, shaking, shaking down and getting ready to become an operational uh, member of the PLA Navy. And, and then the question will be, what kind of aircraft will she have? And, you know, there's talk that she, they'll, they'll probably put on the J-35, uh, which is really their uh, F-22 stealth fighter. They've mar marinized uh, that was the FC-31. That'll become the J-35. And so they'll have that. And then there's talk of... Uh, uh, a fixed wing airborne early uh, warning aircraft, like an E-2 Hawkeye, something along that lines, and then more helicopters. So they'll probably have three major airframes, a, a new fighter, strike fighter, a stealth fighter, uh, and then uh, the airborne early warning, which obviously will help them greatly because they're not going to have greater range uh, because that aircraft will now be able to carry a full bag of gas and ordnance. And then when you have this uh, fixed wing uh, airborne early warning that can stay up for extended periods of time, you really can also, you can really start going longer range power projection. So I think that's really going to be the, the 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 wave of the future. And then there's all this talk about the announcement. Everybody's awaiting for the announcement for the fourth carrier. Um, and again, this political commissar in March timeframe said, "Yeah, we're gonna you know we're gonna announce a fourth carrier." And, and when asked, would it be nuclear power? He didn't confirm or deny, but he smiled. So there's all this expectation that it would be a nuclear uh, propelled, uh, propulsion uh, for that carrier. And that would then put them into the, you know, basically into the same arena as the United States Navy, except behind in terms of uh, experience and numbers of platforms. Right. And that, that carrier, so they've gone from roughly like uh, 65, 70,000 tons with the, the first two to 75, 80,000 tons with the Fujian. And then that fourth one, it, the rumor is it'd be 100,000 tons plus. So that's Nimitz, you know, Nimitz Ford class carrier size. Correct. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move on a little bit. I want to talk about some of the partnerships with uh, other navies. So your article mentions uh, the naval partnership with Russia and Iran. Uh, for more than 20 years now, we've seen the PLAN and the Russian Navy conducting annual naval exercises. 
Uh, Jim, how have those exercises changed over time? The more ships, more complex maneuver, combined C2, pull us, pull that apart a bit for us. I think what we're seeing in the China Navy, uh, Russia Navy uh, cooperation and, and work together, if you go back to um, the, some of the peace missions from 2005, and there would be rumors and reports coming out that the Russians were laughing at the Chinese. The Chinese were not up to par. We'd seen when they'd given the, the Russians had sold the sovereign, sovereignties, uh, DDGs to the, to the Chinese. The Chinese had trouble when they first started doing underway replenishment and they'd splatter diesel marine all over the, the, the hulls of their ships. I remember that still from being on out on Kitty Hawk and the Japanese were showing us the pictures of this, you know, they couldn't get it done. The next year they did it, but it, you know, they just were not comfortable with these extended operations at sea. And uh, that was 20 years ago. And now what we've seen over the last couple of years is this kind of, I would say, mutual respect between the two navies uh, the Chinese, as I said, and the Russians circumnavigated uh, Japan again this year with over over 10 uh, combatants operating together. Um, they operate in the Sea of Japan. They operate in the Yellow Sea. Uh, they're, they're, they're going into each other's ports. Um, they operated in an exercise out in the Gulf of Oman, the security belt. Uh, which is now, they just, they, they did one, what we write about in the article in March of 2023, they just did one this March 2024. So it's the fourth time that the, the Russians and the Iranians and uh, the Chinese Navy are operating together. And the one in March of 2023, the Chinese had a Type 055 Ren High class cruiser. Uh, so, I mean, they sent, you know, one of their best platforms. Now, uh, the, the Iranians had a destroyer and the, and the Russians just had Admiral Gorshkov, a small frigate. But the point is, it wasn't a lot of platforms, but they are working together, and there seems to be this steady, consistent increase of uh, coordination and operations. We, and we see it with their air forces as well. So it's across the board. You know, we just had Putin visit Beijing. It seems to me that the readout from that is that, <laughs> that you know, they, nobody wants to call it an alliance in the United States, but it seems very much to me that it's a military alliance and they're working together uh, and, and they have a singular plan, which is to destabilize the United States and, and to put us down. Uh, and, uh, and, they're, and in the military and the naval arena, they're doing that. And, you know, we kind of think of the Taiwan invasion scenario. We only think of China, 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 China. Well, what's, what's Russia's role going to be in that? What's Russia's role? Is it just going to be sit by and watch? Maybe. But maybe not. Uh, yeah. All this coordinated exercises and activities uh, and sharing of intelligence. Uh, and, and, and if nothing else, the Russians will be able to uh, make the Japanese have to check, uh, check six before they try to, you know, go full hog into defending Taiwan with us if we were to do that. So I think yeah. it's it, there. If anything else, these ap these operations together cause us to have to say, well, what do we do about this combined force? We like to talk about the United States and AUKUS and our allies and the, the strength of our alliance structure. And we kind of dismiss that the Chinese have no allies and no friends. And we say that about Russia. But in this case, they, they do. And in fact, this uh, C, uh, security belt exercise in, uh, in the Gulf of Oman this year, there were like seven or eight other observer nations there. So it's not just the Russians and the Chinese. They have a lot of other nations that are coming and observing. Now, they're not great powers and they don't have great navies, but if you add it all up together, it, it, it's, it's a block and you have to yeah. take that into consideration. Yeah, and any um, evidence that the uh, Russian and uh, Chinese navies are mutually refueling each other or replenishing each other, or do they, when they go out and operate together, do they bring their own oilers and, and do that uh, separately? I have not seen evidence of under, mutual underway replenishment. We've seen it in the air where we've had bombers from Russia escorted by Chinese fighters and vice versa. Uh, that's different, though, than underway replenishment or, or ammunition transfers or things of that nature. I'm sure that they have personnel uh, swaps and things of that nature, but I haven't seen anything that says they're doing or any pictures of unreps together. Not yet.
Got it. Got it. All right. We're running a little short on time. I um, want to finish with the, the last section of your article, which was titled Preparing for War at Sea. In addition to everything we've already discussed, which is clearly, uh, it, you know, clear indicators that the Chinese are preparing for war at sea. Um, you know, what, what's the ultimate goal here? And, and, you know, just how, what are some other maybe uh, things that you're keeping a close eye on as you think about, you know, uh, Admiral Dong Jun and, uh, and the PLA uh, writ large uh, as they, as they, you know, think about and they prepare for the potential for war at sea? Well, Bill, I, I put it in the article, but and I have to give credit to the folks from the China Maritime Studies Institute and uh, Ryan Martinson for, for ferreting this out of Chinese literature. But in December of 2022, in the, after the first year of Admiral Dong's leadership and command of the PLA Navy, he held a conclave of PLA senior admirals and officers. And uh, at that event, uh, they got together and they spent several days talking about where we're going as a PLA Navy and as, a, as the PRC. And the, the, the money quote there that answers your question is, uh, uh, the gathering could be reduced to a single critically important theme. And this is the theme that, that Ryan got from their literature. Make all necessary preparations to defeat the U.S. Navy in great power war at sea. And so I've been saying, and you knew this from when we were in uniform, the Chinese Navy wants to defeat the U.S. Navy, the Pacific Fleet, in a war at sea. And this Admiral Dong, when, you know, two years ago when he was running the Navy, brought all his guys together and said, this is what we got to do. This is our mission. And now he's in charge of the PLA. And so he's now got a lot more resources. He's going to be able to divert and move money into the PLA Navy uh, and PLA Marine Corps, for that matter, to achieve his goal, because they know that if they put the U.S. Pacific Fleet down, uh, then they they rule the waves, they rule the seven seas, and uh, we can't let that happen. Can't get much more explicit than that. And uh, you know, as you and I learned as uh, ensign intelligence officers a very long time ago, the threat is a combination of two things: its capabilities and its intentions. And I think in this discussion here, Jim, you've laid out both the capabilities that the Chinese have been intently building for a long time now. Uh, but then that, that phrase, that statement there, uh, in a conclave of the senior leadership of the Chinese Navy, they've laid out their intention. Uh, so to, to my mind, that's, uh, that's a pretty scary combination. It is very, very, it's a serious one. And it should be causing folks in, in Washington and the Pentagon it, it, for me, it's 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 we should be at general quarters in terms of our shipbuilding industry and our shipbuilding capabilities and plans and strategy. It's time for a two ocean front navy uh, that we you know was created in 1940 in the in the face of uh, w emerging World War II. And we're at the, we're almost at we are at that point in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think uh, all the authors in the American Sea Power Project over the last couple of years would agree with you. Yeah, great points. Well, uh, Jim, as always, this has a, been a fascinating conversation, uh, and I, I can't thank you enough for continuing to write for proceedings about the PLA Navy uh, and taking your time today to be with us on the show. Well, it's it's my honor to to speak to the Naval Institute. Uh, my heart, even though I'm landlocked in the middle of Europe, uh, my mind and my soul are in the ocean and in the sea, and so. Whatever we can do to wake up America, that's 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 my mission along, I know, is yours as well. Yeah, amen. All right. Well, thanks, Jim. Okay, this episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. If you are a member, thank you. If you're not one yet, please join us at usni.org forward slash join. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.